Hello everybody. Welcome to the 2020 CliffGrad Science Collaboration webinar series. Thank you all for joining us. We might still have a few more people join, but we will kick the session off now. Um, so haven't met many of you in person. I'm Hazel Tomlin. I work for the Global Research Alliance Secretariat on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases. So the GRA and I am the current coordinator for the CliffGrads program. Cool. So some of you have already been using the question and answer box. This is structured. I've seen a couple of questions. This is structured as a webinar, which means that you won't be able to access the mic as a participant, um, nor share your video, but you will be able to ask questions in the question and answer box. So that is a small um, double chat box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A and you can open that and then you can actually use an upvote function if you see a question that you would like to have answered by any speaker. So we would encourage you to use that and we would also encourage you to please um, comment if you have anything relevant to add to a question that is asked. So the 2020 series will cover five special sessions and also five thematic sessions. So the special sessions will have five guest presenters and we'll be covering topics relevant to you all as CliffGrads alumni. And the special sessions audience is open to all alumni and all hosts. And the student thematic sessions will essentially allow the round three students to present their PhD research to one another and collaborate with one another. So the audience for those sessions is the CliffGrad students only from all four rounds. Today we are going to have Hayden Montgomery, who's the special representative of the Global Research Alliance. Some of you have already met him speak to us about agriculture in the context of climate change and also the Global Research Alliance and CCAF's research networks. And then I will speak to you about how to make the most of your CliffGrads experience. So some of the resources that we have set up for you. We are going to have a panel of alumni, previous alumni who have already completed their CliffGrads research visit. And we'll also have Sunero Costa Jr. who is the science officer of CCAF's the Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security Low Emissions Development flagship of the CGIAR program. And we'll have question and answer sessions at the end of each of the speakers. So please do use that question and answer box. Right, so I will hand over to Hayden now. Thanks Hazel. And I'll just uh, share my screen. And hopefully that will great. So thanks very much, Hazel, and um, greetings, uh, everybody. Good evening from New Zealand, and good morning or good day to wherever you are in the world. I see we have a lot more people that have joined now. Um, so as Hazel mentioned, I'm the special representative of the Global Research Alliance, and so that function is to uh, assist the chair and the vice chair of the GRA and its research group co-chairs to basically strengthen the organization and give it more visibility in international climate change uh, uh, policy and research fora um, and um, try to um, connect the GRA community with with other research and policy communities and and, and help manage the partnerships that the GRA maintains with with other organizations and um, the CGIR CCAFs program that I'll talk about soon is one of those very important partners of, of the GRA. So I'll just speak to you for 10 or 15 minutes, I guess, and then there'll be time for questions if there are any um, afterwards. Um, and I just want to cover um, some of the, the, I guess, the policy context for the, um, the Cliff Grads program, um, starting with the Paris Agreement on climate change. Um, and uh, just uh, probably you're all very familiar with this, but, um, and you may have seen me present in other webinars in the last little while, but um, I wanted to have a, at least a coherent presentation here today. So 
I wanted to focus on on two particular um, aspects of the Paris Agreement um, and the, the the connection with agriculture, which is um, really, I guess, the first um, and strongest um, treatment of agriculture in a climate change treaty. Uh, it was never uh, so strong within the Convention on Climate Change and in the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, agriculture was uh, pretty much um, invisible. It was it was all about the uh, economy wide targets. And so what was achieved in the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, of course, is we have a temperature um, target or a couple of temperature targets of the two degrees and the 1.5 degrees. Um, and the way that that temperature target is reflected in the Paris Agreement Treaty uh, is effectively um, as one element of a, of, a, of a chapter or a paragraph that um, alongside it is a, an additional objective which relates to uh, the idea of low greenhouse gas emissions development taking place in a manner that does not threaten food production. And so this is a very explicit and equal treatment of food production in the context of the climate targets, which I think is very important um, uh, positioning of agriculture. Um, and when, when it comes to uh, the role of agriculture in contributing to the overall goal of the Paris Agreement in terms of its temperature target, um, some work has been conducted to try to um, model uh, what would be, I guess, considered to be a fair contribution of agriculture alongside other sectors um, to be consistent with a uh, two degree warming scenario or a no more than two degree warm, warming scenario. And the modeling, um, and of course, as you, many of you know, modeling is um, not without its difficulties, but it came up with a uh, a tentative number that was that by 2030 we would need to be seeing reductions um, of one gigaton from the entire agriculture sector globally um, in order to um, for agriculture to play a part in achieving that 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 um, no more than two degrees warming um, and when i'm talking about agriculture and in, in this context i'm talking about just the methane and nitrous oxide from agriculture so that's not an insignificant reduction in um, the next 10 years um, to, be, to be making. Uh, that's per annum, of course. Um, and then subsequent modeling was done that said, well, what do we know about the potential for agriculture to reduce its emissions? And again, only looking at the non-CO2 the non greenhouse gases. And a series of three different models, um, um, sorry, the, the three different models gave us the, the one gigaton um, uh, reductions required. Uh, additional analysis was done looking at the marginal abatement costs of reducing greenhouse gases and it came up with numbers quite significantly lower. So basically it said that um, while the sector should deliver one gigaton, we can only get between 20 and 40 percent of that uh, out of currently available and cost effective technologies and practices. And so the message there I guess to the research community is we need a lot more uh, solutions and we need those solutions to be lower cost. And, and the other point this, that this analysis um, demonstrates is there's also a role for soil carbon to be part of that, that reduction um, contribution from agriculture, not, notwithstanding the challenges of, of soil carbon sequestration. Um, I guess the other point I want to highlight is, is that in response to the Paris Agreement, we saw a lot of um, a change in the way that countries were you know, thinking about their climate targets, climate commitments. And for the first time, really, agriculture um, became prominent within um, the nationally determined contributions, uh, or in this case, the intended nationally determined contributions, and that was pre before they were ratified in the Paris Agreement. Uh, and the good news is that while in many cases the way that the um, the targets or the or the actions that are um, articulated are not necessarily very precise and maybe lack data. Uh, to underpin them. Um, the good news is that many, many countries in all regions of the world included agriculture in their, in their climate uh, action plans, which is a very good starting point for further work, of course, and, and all countries um, have a requirement to, uh, to regularly update and, and improve their nationally determined contributions. So, so I think if we can look at you know, the, the chart on the right of this uh, slide, and I, I think you can see my pointer maybe, I'm not sure, um, you can see that in all regions uh, of the world, you have very significant um, proportions of countries, including uh, mitigation and agriculture within their targets, which is which is good. Um, the other uh, quite recent thing we've seen also is that you know because of the Paris Agreement and other other commitments, we're seeing um, perhaps even more ambitious um, 
action being taken from outside the public sector, and that is with financial institutions and investors starting to green their investment, um, divest from fossil fuels and, and such things. So, you know, these are these are these are funds and investors that that um, think in decadal time time frames. So. It's very important that these these entities are already starting to think about um, their investment decisions because the decisions that these uh, entities, companies, etc., make today will be um, will be with us for the next you know two to three decades. And of course, you all know um, there's been a significant change in the way that youth have been mobilised and advocating for, for very strong and ambitious climate action from governments. And of course, Greta Thunberg is probably the most most prominent, but there are a number of others in different regions that have joined her and been part of this this global youth movement to promote stronger stronger action from governments. And um, they've had a very prominent place within the United Nations Secretary General process. Uh, Greta and, and her colleagues were on the on the stage uh, last year in New York, and they were really they were really pushing governments hard. I was there and I heard it, and um, it was quite impressive. Um, so that's the sort of the context for um, the CGIR and the GRA. And uh, I now want to just talk about first the CGIR, and um, I'm, I'm giving this presentation on behalf of the, of the GRA and the, C, the CCAF CGIR team. Uh, Lenny Wallenberg, who uh, couldn't be with us at the moment, and Senero, but I'm, I'm very happy to, to provide the presentation on their behalf. And so first to introduce the CGIR to you, um, this is a, an international agricultural research consortium that it comprises of 15 centres uh, and you can see on the map where they're located in terms of their, their head offices. Uh, many centres have multiple offices co-located around the world with other centres. Um, and then there are many, many partners that the CGIR works with to, in order to advance its, um, its activities. In terms of its activities, um, currently at least, uh, there are 11 programs. And so the top, the top row, you have fish, trees, livestock, maize, et cetera, uh, climate being one of those. And then you have three so-called platforms that cut across the CGIR. And so you have a big data platform, a breeding platform, and a gene bank platform. And the, the last two are a particularly um, strong CGIR, uh, let's say, areas of, of capability and very traditional areas of the CGIR with crop improvements and gene banks and things like that. It's kind of the green revolution was driven by the CGIR and its scientists. And so the, C, the, the climate program sits within this uh, landscape of, of activity and CCAFs, uh, which I'll come on to now, is the, um, is the, the program uh, coordination mechanism to address climate change in a cross-cutting manner across all of the, uh, the CGIR system and, and all of its centers. <clears throat> And so when you look at the, the climate change agriculture and food security program, you'll see a number of research flagships, one of which is low emissions development. And that's where Scenario is working with, with Linny as the leader and where the, the, the Cliff Grads program has been um, uh, developed and, and, and advocated. And you can see also on the slide, the regions where um, at least until now, CCAFs have been uh, operating. Um, before going on to uh, GRA and, 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 and um, and the rest of the presentation, just in terms of the work of, of CCAFs, uh, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a great varied um, varied uh, t work program across these different flagships. And the, C and the CCAFs program produces um, science blog and, uh, material, it produces um, opinion pieces, scientific publications, makes investments in capability building, et cetera. And it also led most recently this, um, this process and a very uh, significant uh, consultation process associated with it around our actions to transform the food system. And, and this report was uh, published in the uh, middle of June this year and it's worth, it's worth having a look at if you haven't already. Uh, in terms of some of the activities that CCAF have undertaken in the last, um, well, in the current trainium as it's called, uh, you have these projects uh, in different, with different centres as partners. Um, and focusing on different um, aspects of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gas mitigation. And as I mentioned earlier, the CGI itself then works with a multitude of other partners and I won't, read, I won't name them all here, but you have uh, NGOs, you have um, development policy partners, you have uh, research partners, and of course you have the centers themselves. Uh, and the private sector. So a very, a very you know, diverse group of partners that assist the CGR in, in delivering its work. Uh, and now in terms of the Global Research Alliance, um, this is a different sort of um, entity. It's not a, um, 
it's not a bricks and mortar institution. It's a virtual organization comprising 62 member countries. And those are the, the dark blue colored um, uh, on, this, on this map here. Um, and typically speaking, the, the members of the GRA are represented by their ministries of agriculture. Not always, but mostly. And then those um, representatives, um, they decide uh, in which research groups of the GRA that, that their country wishes to participate, and they will nominate uh, contact points to represent that country in the groups. And if you can see on the right of this, you'll see we have a, a research group on paddy rice, livestock, croplands, and we have an integrative group that, cut, <coughs> excuse me, that cuts across soil carbon and, and measurement issues. We have um, Within these groups, uh, these groups have established a number of scientific networks that already you can participate in as, as you know, any individual expert that, that is interested in a particular field. Um, the, the networks are all available on the website within the research group web pages, and you'll be able to see what, what's happening there. And usually there's a, a contact person. So if you're interested in animal selection and genetics and genomics or microbiology or crop agroforestry systems or you name it, um, you can already get involved in those without you know, having to be formally part of the member uh, as a member country. Um, and then we have a whole host of different activities that we promote, um, awards and scholarships programs, see the Cliff Grads being one of those, and uh, a growing uh, portfolio of investments that we uh, help promote and that our members invest in. Um, in mitigation science and, um, and capability building activities to improve greenhouse uh, gas inventories, um, measure greenhouse gases in the field, provide guidance manuals and other technical documents to, to assist countries to um, design policy better effectively. Um, in terms of our partners, uh, you'll see here the CGR is one of our uh, strategic partners and then we have a host of others um, many of which are repeated on the on the previous slide with CCAF so it's, you know, we're working on a similar community um, we have development banks private sector technical platforms that are in, in different regions um, we work with other initiatives like CCAFs or like the CCAC which is a climate and clean air coalition uh, European research uh, platform called FACHA JPI which is food security agriculture climate change uh, the European Commission and so on and so forth. Uh, we also have the good fortune to being accredited observer of the IPCC process. So members of the GRA can nominate scientists through the GRA accredited observer status uh, to be lead authors and other contributors to the IPCC process, which is which is really great. Um, just in terms of um, investments that the GRA is going to be making and, and um, this is a bit of a sort of conceptualization of this because of course we rely on the members own contributions and our, and our partners contributions but we work across um, capability building trainings we have these awards and scholarship programs we're going to have a big focus on both the mitigation research agenda um, helping coordinate our members research budgets and trying to accelerate the progress by doing so uh, as well as investing a lot in improved measurement and quantification of greenhouse gases in developing country regions and we're looking to develop these regional hubs with capability in, in key areas that can help serve multiple countries and all that should feed up into um, improving inventories as the main framework within which countries can quantify their emissions from agriculture um, we want to validate science on the, in the farms by by investing in small scale pilot mitigation projects or demonstration projects. And all of this we hope will contribute to improved policy development and, and overall accelerated action on addressing uh, greenhouse gases from agriculture. <coughs> this map on the right just shows you the current, uh, the countries that are leading the different research groups and the, and the, the council. So Cliff Grads, um, this is a bit of a flagship uh, program within um, the GRA and, and CCAFs and we're all very pleased and proud of it. Um, and we're really delighted that you've, you've joined us on this webinar. Um, as you know, it's the CliffGrad stands for the Climate, Food and Farming Global Research Alliance Development Scholarships. Uh, we don't come up with short names in this, uh, this territory. We always have these long-winded acronyms. Um, and the background of this is that, you know, we, we wanted to support um, PhD students in developing countries um, in their um, field of research and, and provide opportunities for students um, to get um, alongside, uh, you know, whoops, world's experts um, have access to, to equipment they mightn't have had otherwise, and, and hopefully in the course of doing that, um, you know, improve the quality of their, of their research and their PhDs, and uh, integrate um, both 
the cliff grad students with each other and also to our, our research community we have in the GRA. And, and we know that in time and even already, um, cliff grad students are strengthening our own country's contributions to the GRA community, which is really fantastic. So the way it works, um, we have these fellowships, which are about 10,000 US, sometimes more um, per student. That's for up to six months, of course, of, uh, well, normally, <laughs> normally up to six months based in a, uh, somewhere in the world. Um, of course, with COVID, we're having to work slightly, slightly differently in the, in the short term. Um, we have an objective to award 50% um, of the awards to, to women. Uh, we haven't achieved that regularly, but we, we strive to, that, to do that. So for you uh, women in the, in the audience, please promote this widely with your, with your, with your colleagues. Um, funding for this, the Cliff Grads program is uh, provided by the New Zealand government uh, through its Ministry for Primary Industries and by uh, the CGI Trust Fund donors. The, the focus of the awards are always mitigation uh, as, the, as the primary focus um, across all agricultural subsectors, um, primarily on the production end of the supply chain, so on-farm greenhouse gases, uh, and also there have been a few awards that have focused on food loss and waste uh, emissions. Um, we have had a workshop, um, there may be a bit more on this later, um, I won't take much more time talking about that. Um, and we, we try to find opportunities to integrate you all into the work of CCAFs and the work of the GRA. We, we have a very strong interest in doing that and we hope you'll take those opportunities. Um, and it's a program that uh, while it's called Cliff Grads now, it used to be called Cliff and we sort of um, modified and, and, add and, and strengthened the investment in, in what, what was already exist in existence um, through CCAFs with the Cliff program that Ngoni, uh, who's on this webinar, set up and, um, and we're really pleased to be able to take it to a new level. Um, in terms of um, the perception or the, um, let's say, how, how the Cliff Grads program is, is seen by those who have um, who've, uh, taken advantage of it, um, we, did, we did a survey um, recently and um, the, the, in terms of assessing the impact of the, of the, uh, the program, and as you can see, a very positive response rate across um, deepening understandings, building new partnerships, learning new techniques, quality of thesis, new and improved research, um, you know, above 90% in all of those categories. So at least for the people who are um, benefiting from the program, um, there is a very strong benefit that's, that's perceived, which is really satisfying for us. Um, so I think that's it from me. Um, I'll happily take any questions um, if there are any, and I'll uh, pass back to Hazel, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Hayden. We have had a few questions come through. Um, I'll start off with one question. So we've seen a recent increase in the number of agriculture mitigation strategies that have been included in nationally determined contributions. Why do you think we've seen the recent shift? I think, um, I think, it, well, a number of reasons. Um, more countries, and particularly in the developing regions, have, um, through the Paris Agreement commitments, um, had to prepare national, uh, nationally determined contributions, and, and that wasn't a requirement of all countries in the past under the Convention and the Kyoto Protocol. So um, when, when those economies consider climate action, it's inevitable that agriculture is part of that because agriculture is a very significant part of the economy. And, and like in New Zealand and some very few developed countries, uh, agriculture is uh, often more than half or, or extremely high proportion of national emissions. So it's difficult to overlook it. I think also there's been a strong push from, um, or an expectation from society that, that agriculture is not, um, ag agriculture needs to contribute. Um, notwithstanding the challenges and of course um, the issues and prim primacy of food security, um, there's an expectation out there and a growing one that um, that agriculture is, is, you know, part of the problem, if you like, um, and, and it should be part of the solution. So I think it's probably multiple reasons. Thank you. We have a question here from Cesar, Cesar Pinares Patino, that host institutions in developed countries seem to attract more candidates than institutions in developing countries. This seems to conflict with the objectives of the program. Um, can you comment on how we might encourage 
more hosts in developing countries? Um, thanks, Cesar. Um, I'm not sure I would, I say it would conflict with the objectives of the program. I think the objectives of the program are providing um, really good opportunities for PhD students to advance their research in, you know, in places that have the capability that they may not, may not have in their host un, home university. Um, so if by being in a developed country institution, I don't think that's necessarily conflicting with that objective, but certainly we do like to see hosts from many different regions and um, we have seen more hosts over the different rounds coming from um, developing country uh, regions and institutions. So um, I guess I guess that will grow and I think um, probably as uh, the capacity and the capability grows within developing country institutions, there'll be more opportunity or more possibility for hosts um, to come from those institutions as well. So I think probably we'll see over time an evolution of, you know, um, hosts be more able to host um, or institutions in developing countries be more able to host when their own capability has been built further. Yeah, that might relate a little bit to the visibility of the program as well. And we've definitely seen increasing visibility of the yep. grads program um, of the previous two rounds, at least. So there's another question here about international agreements regarding climate change adaptation and mitigation. And um, yeah, perhaps Hayden, you can comment on international agreements and how climate change and adaptation mitigation is implemented. I see the question, yeah. Do I think that they're all implemented? Um, to varying degrees. <laughs> uh, I guess never as much as one would hope when the commitments are made. Um, I guess that's what we're, we're trying to do through our work within the GRA and what CCAS tries to do as well as assist countries to be able to implement those commitments they've made. And let's, let's, let's sort of reflect on, on reality, what happens in these processes. You have a very compressed and highly sort of high politically charged occasion, say the Paris summit or other um, cops at the end of the year and the climate change process where uh, in that moment um, countries are pushed harder than they may have been prepared and uh, it means that sometimes you have um, a bit of catching up to do an implementation in the years uh, ensuing that commitment um, that was you know made under under significant political pressure and so I think it's probably inevitable that the actual implementation will, will follow a little bit behind the, the ambition that's been stated at the higher level in, the, in those treaties and, and other agreements. Thank you. We have, um, we have another question here from Maxwell. Uh, so he's asked, how does the focus of CLIF and CCAPS merge with small data collected from research that is not representative of, of big data, which could be ideal for the generalization of national policies related to agricultural missions? Yeah, good question. Um, this is the big challenge we have, uh, not just for, for data collected in CCAFs and, uh, and cliff grads, but um, just generally data representative nature of it or not. Um, uh, I, I guess, first of all, it would depend on the projects that have been done, but where those projects would be collecting data relevant to, say, quantify greenhouse gases at a national level, um, there are, there have, well, there are, the databases are being developed in different emission sources that um, within which the, the data collected by CCAF stu um, cliff grad students could be could be um, submitted and CCAFs have the samples uh, website which has tried to do a similar thing and, and creating a database and collecting data from different areas of the world and, and making that available in a sort of publicly public publicly available way but but it's a very good question and it is, it is a, a very significant challenge is sort of harmon harmonization of data uh, ensuring that the data is representative um, and useful for policy making and um, I guess the way we, we're approaching the our investments through the GRA is, is we see that the, the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory is the primary and best framework to to collect that data and um, the trick is how we can have multiple um, sources of data that can contribute to that. Um, so I don't have a very <laughs> sort of co coherent answer on that one because I think it's it's the challenge we all face um, but we are trying to create frameworks and databases that can help uh, improve that. Thank you, Hayden. 
If there are no more questions, then I will hand over to Sanero to make the introductions to our alumni panel. Great, so uh, Hazel, can you uh, change slides, please? Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. So uh, very quickly, and uh, thank you, Hazel, for that. And just uh, echoing my colleagues, uh, I also welcome you in, in, on behalf of CCAFs to this new round of uh, Cliff Grads uh, webinar. So this is amazing to, to have you um, here. So uh, my name is Siniro, and I'm a science officer of the CCAFs Low Emissions Development Flagship, which is led by Lynn Wallenberg, that you all uh, meet soon in the coming uh, webinars. So uh, now we are going to uh, go to the alumni panel where uh, former uh, Cliff grad students will share with us their experience. And uh, to start it off, we're gonna have uh, Samuel Anuga from Ghana. Uh, he uh, participated in the round two of Cliff. He, he participated in the, the second round of uh, Cliff grads. Uh, supervised by uh, Nagoni with uh, a project called uh, Just How Smart Are the Climate Smart Options Promoted in the Climate Smart Villages of Nicaragua. So Samuel Anuga, the floor is, the floor is yours, please. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Scenario, and uh, so good to see you again for a very long time. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, greetings to you wherever you are across the world. Um, so as scenario indicated, I had the opportunity to have my Cliff Grad Fellowship at SEAT, uh, worked on the project How Smart Are the Climate Smart Agriculture Options Promoted in the Climate Smart Villages of Nicaragua. Okay, so in my project, there was a, a little change and I had the privilege to work across not only climate smart villages in Nicaragua, but <clears throat> and the other climate smart villages across Latin America, Southeast Asia, and then Africa. So I would like to share with you some of the experiences I had working in Seattle. Um, one amazing experience for me was the working environment in Seattle because uh, it was a wonderful scientific community for me. It was the first time to work in a lab um, measuring greenhouse gas emissions, which I started uh, working on on my PhD from Ghana. It was really a very good opportunity for me to work in such a scientific environment, working with Ngoni and uh, other CCAFs team who really provided wonderful support on my uh, scientific project. And uh, yeah, Aside working on my project, it was a new environment for me. So I took the opportunity to also interact, making new friends because uh, Colombia, where the center is, is, is a friendly country. And I had the opportunity to make a lot of friends in Colombia because the people are so excited, you know, everyone supported me. Uh, I joined groups, went for hiking. You, you can see in the videos, it's really, really a lot of fun in Colombia for me and I really enjoyed the people I met in Colombia. Uh, scenario, you can go to the next slide. Yes, so uh, aside my friendship making and working on my project, it was an opportunity for me to visit the country. So I took a few holidays to go around. Uh, I worked from Cali, which the center is, but I tried to visit other cities. And if you heard of Medellin, Medellin is one of the popular cities in uh, Colombia and one of the major tourist destinations. So I went to Medellin, um, visiting a lot of craft uh, centers. And then I went to El Pano, which is very popular in Medellin and in Colombia. So it was really uh, an amazing experience for me to see these places. Watching movies, I see like uh, about Medellin and all that. So having a, uh, like that kind of experience physically by visiting the place was really, really amazing for me. So 
I, I, I appreciate that from the Cliff Cat support. And scenario, you can go to the next one. Yes, uh, I like food. Okay. <laughs> Colombia has uh, amazing dishes that you could try. And because I made a lot of friends, uh, when there is a party, people invited me to their homes. Oh, some will come for dinner today. So yeah, it was very good for me to experience different cuisines from Colombia, uh, empanadas, uh, a lot of them which I wouldn't have ever had the opportunity to, to have a feel. But visiting Colombia was so amazing to get to taste these foods and all that. So um, aside my slides, one of two things I would like to share with those who are yet to visit their centers for their Cliff Grad Fellowship. One thing I would like to share with you, which is most important from experience is communication. And you need to, see your host not just uh, as a scientific person who is going to support you in your project but somebody that you can share uh, whatever you think you can share with because for me it was uh, working with Ngoni he became more like a family to me and I didn't just ask him or share my uh, concerns with him on the project but other issues anything I wanted to talk to him about I did talk to him about and he was very open uh, instances where he could not help he could bring someone on board who could give me the right support and all that so i think those who are going for their fellowships communication is very very important just try to be open as much as possible with your host um, whatever it is uh, you'll be surprised they always have the solution so you should be uh, forthcoming in the way you communicate with your host supervisor another thing i would like to put across is try to have patience with your host supervisor, because normally they already have a lot on their table. They are working on uh, a lot of projects across the world, not only on your project. So you should also exercise a bit of patience when you get there and things are a bit slow. Just try to uh, have patience. And as I said, communicate. At the end of the day, it's going to be successful. You will like it. You will have wonderful experience and you come out, you know, amazing and both in the scientific community and then in your social life. So um, thank you very much. These are the few things I would like to share with everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Samuel. This is amazing to, to hear from you. That's a great uh, testimony, really, really useful. And uh, I, I hope you are uh, well, and I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. Uh, thanks thank you again. So much. Thank thanks. You, so thanks. Uh, so moving on, uh, we're gonna hear uh, now from uh, Titi's Ab Abdini from uh, Indonesia. <clears throat> she was uh, uh, hosted by Bangor uh, University in 2019, supervised by Dr. Uh, Gibbon, Gibbons. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, in the project she uh, developed, uh, was related to the economic implications of greenhouse gas and mitigation from dairy system systems in Costa Rica. So Titis, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Siniro. Uh, can you hear me clearly? I think there is a noise behind me because there is a praying alarms going on in Indonesia at this moment. Yes, I'm, I'm hearing you uh, very uh, clearly. Okay. Perfect. So I remember when I applied Cliff Grads, um, I, I am very grateful to be accepted in this program and um, to have the opportunity of doing research with the expertise that used to be known on the paper. When I looked up into the several projects when I applied for this program, I really looked into the programs and the, supervi and the supervisors and I used the opportunity to have a nice scientific interaction with the, with the scientists that uh, used to be only on the screen for me. So this, that was a very remarkable experience for me. Well, uh, I would like to share you many aspects of the experiences that I gained through this program. First, of course, the academic skills. So um, my assignment is related to the system approach to 
to conduct environmental and economic assessments from dairy farming. Well, my background itself, I'm now doing PhD in Wageningen University, working on Indonesian dairy farming system to assess their environmental impact and selected mitigation scenarios for Indonesian farming systems, which is very different from Costa Rica. So here with, through this uh, fellowship, I recognize the different systems of dairy farming and um, I was familiar with the, with the method to assess environmental assessment better. In this case, uh, we use life cycle assessments and also on top of the life cycle assessment because our main objective is to assess economic implication. Um, through the fellowship, I learned how to how to how to do or how to conduct marginal abatement cost curve to assess economic implication of a different mitigation scenarios for Costa Rican dairy farming systems. And of course, by the end of the fellowship, I had a very nice opportunity to to uh, write a scientific article and uh, summarize all of the results that from my assignments into a nice paper with uh, the other uh, research teams in the projects. Next, please, Siniro. Yeah, so uh, within the project itself, I learned so much from the research team because uh, the project where I was participating is called Suscorida or Sustainable Costa Rican Dairy Farming. Um, dairy farming in the future and uh, Suscorida had the partners not only from Bangor University itself but uh, the researcher from Bangor University works with the researcher from Rod Samset Research UK, Katie in Costa Rica and other local partners such as Ministry of Agriculture in Costa Rica and Dos Pinos, the biggest dairy cooperative in Costa Rica. So um, being part of the, of the project as a Cliff grad student, I was introduced to the different scientists, different experts from the local partners. And of course, I learned a lot from them about their um, expectation from the project, about their vision to the project and about the, the method or their research design that they want to, uh, that they want to um, c conduct through the project. So here, uh, I learned a lot how to have a nice dialogue with the different people from different backgrounds of expertise about um, achieving the mission of the project itself. So it's really big project. It has a, it has a, a very uh, ambitious, ambitious objective to, and to achieve that objective, they, they involve many partners in the project. So this is very valuable experience because in the future, if we want to apply for a grant or if we want to apply for a position in a research uh, project, um, I already have the experience to work with uh, different partners from academics, researchers, and also uh, people from business and government. Next, please. Yeah. Um, Besides the working for the assignment itself, I had an opportunity to visit Costa Rica for a last workshop in last September 2019. That was a workshop that aimed to identify the mitigation options for Costa Rican dairy farms. The workshop itself, it was attended by different stakeholders from governments, universities, uh, organizations, farmers organizations, and also dairy cooperative. So through that workshop, although it was only one day, but um, the research team brought me to the, to the different stakeholders and have a nice conversation about what is truly happening in Costa Rican dairy farms. What are the thoughts of the farmers? What are the, um, the vision of the government? And then having a nice discussion with them uh, to achieve the mission of the Scorida project, it was really um, eye-opening for me. So um, if you have a chance in Cliff Grads and you want to uh, build up your networking and connection for the future, uh, for your future career, um, this is very relevant opportunities. And I will advise, to, uh, I will advise for all of the Cliff Grad fellows to, to maximize this potential and grab the opportunities as much as possible. 
I think that's my last slide or maybe there's a next one or I don't remember exactly. Yeah, so that was that's the last one. Yeah, that's the last one. And yeah, for anyone who are working with the modeling or environmental assessment, I'm happy to discuss anything with you all. Thank you. Uh, Titis, that's, that, thank you so much. That's also uh, great to hear from you. Thank you very much for your testimony in our devices. Really, really useful. And uh, yeah, it sounded that you, you've uh, had a, a great time as a, a Cliff uh, grads uh, recipient. And again, thank you so much. Definitely. Thank and, you, Sinero. Thanks. Uh, and so move on. Uh, now we're going to hear from uh, Florencia uh, Garcia from uh, Argentina. She was hosted by INIA in Chile in 2018 and supervised by Dr. Emilio. Uh, her uh, research project was uh, called Effects of Inhibiting Rumen Methanogenesis on Microbial Biomass Production and Composition. So Florencia, uh, thanks for uh, being here and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sinido, for the introduction. Um, hi everybody, wherever you are so many and firm. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing my experience, which was an excellent uh, experience. Uh, Hazel, uh, next please. <clears throat> uh, next slide, sorry. Uh, well, my supervisors, Emilia and Camila, were, uh, gave me a lot of support from the very beginning. We had um, a couple of uh, virtual meetings, even before I, I went to, to Chile, that really gave me a picture, allowed me to get a picture of what uh, the project was and all the things that we were going to do. So that helped me a lot to plan in advance before even I got to Chile. Um, they put a lot of trust in me um, and I was kind of in charge of the operative uh, organization of the experiment and that helped me a lot to build up my confidence. Uh, that was one of my, my big uh, changes for me. Um, I got to use the SF6 technique that is to measure methane from in vivo experiments that I'm trying to set up here in, in Cordoba that we don't yet have. But besides that, uh, being able to use that um, equipment and learn about that, I learned a lot from them. We had many discussions about the experiments. And I remember the first question Emilio asked me in that first virtual kickoff meeting was, what do you think of the science of this? I was kind of knocked out about the question, but I, I'm really thankful for all that I've learned with them. It was a really comprehensive um, thought that, that they, they gave me. Um, I was also very lucky because there was another case grad, Maria de Bernardi, that went to the, the same uh, city, to the same place actually. She was there a month before the right. And that helped me a lot to set up and um, gave me a lot of information and support once I arrived. Uh, next, please. I will take for granted that you're um, really eager to take as much as you, as you can of the exciting experiments that you're going to do. So I will focus more on the personal side in, in, the, in this advice. And the advice will be to please uh, share time, take the opportunity to, to share time outside the, the work, share a, a coffee, share a beer, a trip, or, or even a concert as uh, Camila uh, invited me to. Uh, get to know the people behind the science. Um, I, I treasured some very special lessons I learned from Emilio in those long beer talks. And so get, get the opportunity to know, to know them. I, I really believe that long lasting bonds are built up from these personal bonds, the, the, the friendship that you get to build. 
and also take time to know people working in other areas, in other parts. For example, uh, I participate in, in uh, or I, I join, um, sorry, I share a lot of time with the group that Maria were working, uh, that they work in Seoul, and that definitely uh, also taught me a lot. Uh, next, please, Hazel. <clears throat> And definitely my biggest challenge uh, was that by that time my son had two years old and that was uh, quite challenging, not only for me, but for uh, my family, for, uh, for my partner, and especially for my son, you can imagine. Uh, we had to adapt to a new place, a new family dynamic, uh, he also had to go for in, in, to the kindergarten for one month. So imagine how difficult can that be? Um, by, um, by far, the hardest moment was uh, when I had to say, see you soon. That is the picture there uh, in, the, in the middle that he's saying goodbye. Uh, when he came back to Argentina, um, I spent the last six uh, weeks by myself. And I think that adds on a little uh, extra pressure or at least uh, uh, tension in some moments, complicating the day-to-day the -day activities. That is kind of this whole uh, really comprehensive experience that you get to have. Uh, so this is part of that transformative process that, that changes you a lot, not only in the academic course uh, and professional, but also in the personal uh, aspects yours and, and your whole uh, environment. Next, please. And last, but definitely not least, being awarded a, a Cliff Threat was not only about uh, going to take the opportunity to have this visit uh, accomplished, this visit in, in Chile, and was much more about that. It, it was about uh, being a part of this network of young researchers that will have the same goal of tackling climate change, a big goal, uh, and not much time to, to take action for, for many of these aspects. So um, I, I had uh, this experience meant to me many changes in so many ways. Uh, today I've chosen some aspects to, to share with you, uh, but I'm really happy if you have any other questions, whatever question that might be. And I'm really keen to know about your projects in the following session. So thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing. That'll be all. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Florencia. This is a uh, really useful tips and uh, a very, uh, let's say, uh, touching uh, testimony. Thank you so much for that. In the, this last picture uh, you choose, it's, it's amazing. It's a remarkable time we, we had last year in, in Indonesia. Again, thank you so much for uh, uh, your testimony. So uh, uh, moving on to our uh, last presentation and last uh, student. So that's my uh, country fellow, uh, Yuri from, from Brazil. So Yuri uh, uh, was hosted by ISRIC in the Netherlands in 2000, 2019, supervised by uh, Dr. Uh, Gerard, and uh, he uh, developed a project called Assessing the Impact of Land Use Change Scenarios on Soil Organic Carbon. So uh, Yuri, the floor uh, is yours. Uh, obrigado. Thank you, Senor. Thank you. So yes, I was hosted by ISRIC, that is the International Soil Reference and Information Center. It's also called it uh, usually as a World Soil Information, and it's a, a great environment. So uh, the picture shows from bottom left is the, the building of ISRIC, close by the uh, World Soil Museum, and uh, is the right uh, below the, uh, the above the entrance. Sorry. And uh, the next picture is uh, Stefan, St Stefan Mental, uh, that is the coordinator of the museum. 
and he's uh, very kind and very uh, a great uh, soil scientist. Uh, scientist. And moving on, uh, we have a picture on uh, Gerard Huvenik, that is that was my supervisor at the time. And we were in a, in a dinner and a very uh, friendly and uh, like uh, I would say uh, family moment. And uh, at the back we have, uh, and also to the right, uh, Berta, that was also a second round uh, Cliff grads member. And the, it was really nice that we had uh, closed talks. So we discussed almost every day, like for after the work for one hour or two, what would be to uh, to do to improve my research and his research? So uh, sometimes I, I, I went home and was I was thinking about uh, the talk, and next day I come with a good idea or a new idea to help him. And so uh, uh, so uh, as the opposite is the same. So he was also give me suggestions, and it was a really nice cooperation. And also, Herat was uh, for me like a, a great, uh, I, would say, I would not say boss, but a leader, a very humble and very nice person. I mean, I could uh, stop him in time to, to talk or, or ask some doubt. And he was always open. And even if he had no time, he would say, OK, we talk tomorrow or something. Just we schedule and it will be fine. Uh, next slide, next slide, please. Hi. Uh, yes, thanks. So uh, talking a little about uh, wh what was done there. So the main idea was to predict soil carbon in time in advance. So we predict uh, the, the end of the, the project was to uh, have an idea what would be the soil concentration carbon in, uh, in two, the year of 2070. And the soil accumulated in the carbon accumulated in the soil is uh, directly related with land use. So we developed uh, land use scenarios from 2017, 2030, 15, 70. And also it was related with. Uh, I uh, would say clamite and uh, 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 soil indexes. And it was uh, used in machine learning to have an idea of the, the soil concentration carbon in 2017. Yes, uh, next please. Yeah, uh, I, I had a great opportunity to join uh, one course that was uh, Soils of the World. And this big picture is in, inside the Soil Museum. They have what uh, we, we call monoliths. That is like a sample of soil, the entire profile from all the continents. Uh, it's a really nice place. And also they have like more hundreds of profiles in the basement. And to the right, uh, it was uh, practicing in the field with uh, Stefan uh, Mento and the group. So we were analyzing, discussing the formation of the soil and the aspects of the soil for also for agriculture. Yeah, next, please. And I was very lucky to be volunteer at the Fahini Soil Conference. And so to the left, we can see the volunteer team. And we were uh, helping uh, all the, the conference, all days, the previews. We had meetings and, and those uh, preparation. I said uh, uh, it was a great experience for me to see how uh, the, any conference is built and to see uh, this organization. And to the right, uh, we can see a picture of uh, Erika Miheli. She is from Hungary and also soil scientist. She is a great soil scientist. And, and this uh, was a master class of soil classification. And I was uh, directly in touch with her, helping uh, and previously and on the day. And also helping, I was uh, keep learning about soil. And 
it was a unique experience to be volunteer and, and join all these. Yeah, yes, uh, next please. Yeah, just uh, closing thoughts. To me, to be hosted uh, in Israel was more than uh, exchange, I would say, scholarship. Uh, I, I was in a different environment from the university. It was more like uh, an institute, uh, institute, right? And so I, different from the university, they are running several projects at the same time. So I could see how is the, 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 the life of uh, researchers. And as Titi said, uh, I could uh, be in touch with scientists that before was just on the screen. And I learned a lot with those professionals and uh, we keep in touch. It is really nice. Uh, if they need my help, they just ask. I will be there for any time they, they, they need. And for the, the newcomers, the new, the future scholarshipers, uh, my advice would be uh, just be yourself and talk when you need and you can ask for help. It, it can uh, cut a lot of time that you uh, got stuck at. And uh, integrate with people and culture because as my friend Samuel said, uh, uh, the gastronomy and the habits of the people can be quite interesting. And uh, it's uh, quite unique to learn or to join a new culture. And above all, uh, make friends and enjoy the time. Thank you very much. And also, I would uh, get time to thank Cliff, Cliff grads and all the, the involved. Uh, this were, were, uh, was a, a great time for me. And I learned a lot with those professionals and researchers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yuri. Thank you very much. Uh, very uh, uh, great and, and touching uh, testimony as well. And it sounded uh, to me that you had a, an inter intense uh, research uh, interaction with your colleagues in, in the Netherlands, with, which, it's, uh, is a, which is a great to hear. So uh, yeah, and uh, so we uh, came to an end in terms of the testimonies. So as you may have noticed uh, from then that the Cliff Grads has this power to, to create an environment for uh, unique uh, experiences. And uh, I really hope the, the next uh, and the future recipients uh, may have the, the same chance, right? And now uh, we have the chance to, to know more and to hear more from, from these uh, former uh, Cliff grads uh, recipients, our colleagues today. So any questions for Samuel, Florencia, Titis, uh, or uh, Yuri, please put in the chat and we're gonna ask them uh, thereafter. And thank, thank you, very you much so much you. for all uh, testimonies. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Saniro. Yeah, again, just to mirror what Saniro said, thank you so much for sharing your valuable experience. It's really excellent to hear, and I'm sure it will be extremely relevant for many of the Cliff grads who are about to undertake their journey. Uh, we do actually have one question in here uh, from Sani. So can you share with us your major challenges that you encountered, if there were any? And um, we can take maybe a couple of responses on this one. Yeah, I, I would say some words uh, that my, my biggest challenge was about communication because uh, sometimes you think if I talk to my supervisor too frequently, I would disturb him. But maybe you, you can talk to a colleague and for a, a quick doubt. And But uh, keep your appointments like uh, weekly or uh, every two weeks. So yeah, we, we were... Uh, doing it like that, and it was uh, uh, smooth, I mean, uh, but yeah, you always have to talk. Thanks, Yuri. Okay, <clears throat> Hazel, do you want me to talk? Yeah. Um, can I say something? Please. 
Yeah, okay. So um, one of my biggest challenges was um, the scientific approaches from the beginning because um, I was working on my project in Ghana and I felt I knew what I was doing to, to some extent on my methodologies. But when I got to see it, I realized that it's more in depth than <laughs> the fundamentals I knew. So the beginning was uh, a little bit difficult in terms of getting to work on my project with the methodologies and all that. But of course, that was the reason why I went to see it. And yeah, it was okay by the end of it because uh, my supervisor took me through what I needed to know and how to grab up the project and it was fine. Thank you, Samuel. So we have uh, well, Florencia, you'd like to speak? I see Titus, you've just unmuted as well. Perhaps Titus, you go first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Flor. <laughs> Uh, for me, it was the communication as jury, but more into set the boundary of our work because sometimes your supervisors uh, notice that you are so excited with the assignment and they tend to give you more because they know that you are capable of it. But um, bear in mind that we only have six months or less. So the challenge for me is because I was so excited about everything and doing modeling is playing a lot with the, so many, with the scenarios that we set at the beginning, but of course we have a time limitation. So uh, almost in the end of the fellowship, I should communicate that this is my boundary. This is what, what I think relevant with the, with the narrative of the paper or the deliverable that we uh, agreed upon at the beginning. Thanks. Thank you. And Florencia? Thank you. Uh, I share my, my biggest challenge, and for, by far that was my biggest challenge. So I will focus on the on the second part of the question that uh, Shady said that um, what recommend so what recommendations what would be uh, when you're homesick uh, that 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 is also a big challenge. And I think the recommendation there will be to. Uh, try to do things outside work, uh, meet people, uh, enjoy your time. You're in a different country, uh, surely with lots of things to see, get to travel, get to do cultural things, go to a theater, whatever experience that may uh, do you well, uh, experience food, as uh, Samuel uh, mentioned. You're, obviously, you're not home. Uh, so the, the places you're going to be are not going to be exactly like home. Make it your home. Make it your family uh, person around you. Once you're there, uh, they invited you in a sense. So try to try to build up that uh, bond, that uh, friendship, that family, as uh, Samuel uh, mentioned. So make it that your home. Um, for those things for the, will be the, the challenges to do activities, look for activities. That would be my, my recommendation on that aspect. Thank you. That's really good advice. Thank you, Flora. Uh, there are a few other questions coming through. Um, one, some specifically uh, for you, teachers, which perhaps will connect you afterwards about the modeling. Well, maybe I can ask it now. Um, Ahmed has asked, about if there's any specific modeling software that you could recommend um, to learn ahead of his visit or that will be relevant for some of the other students also doing modeling projects okay um i was about to type my my answer actually i thought that it's for private but i will answer it right now um i didn't have the experience as well at the beginning but the most important thing uh, at the beginning, if you want to work with modeling is to know the flow of the modeling. What is, what is the simulation? What is the output? What is the input for the model? And what is the output of the model? So for me, it really helps to have the visualization by simple diagram. You can use Microsoft Vision, for example, or any other uh, simple software. And then um, after you, we know what, how, how the model works, there are many models that are available out there using simple spreadsheet, 
from Excel or it's written in R or they already provide the model in and develop the software that is easier for you to work in. So it really depends on what is the model or what is the objective that you want to achieve uh, through the modeling. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Um, there are a few questions coming through about the uncertainty related to the pandemic as well. And obviously the situation will be slightly different for round three and round four students. Um, but we will talk a little bit more about the systems that you have in place and yeah, every, every case is a case by case basis, but um, I'm always here if you want to send me an email as well. So we'll go to the next part of the presentation and that is actually there's a picture of you right there, Florencia. <laughs> um, so just to to kind of cover some of the the ways that you can make the most out of your CliffGrads experience, and there are a few systems that we've put in place. Obviously, as you've heard from the previous alumni, you are now current um, representatives for your home institutes in your home countries. And that's in an academic sense and a cultural sense and also a personal sense. So thanks to all of the previous alumni for sharing how they managed to represent their, their countries and home institutes and their cultures really well internationally. And that's obviously something to bear in mind um, for good global ambassadorship and moving forward in your research networks as well. So some of you have already been paired with a buddy in the buddy system that we have set up which pairs previous alumni with new alumni. And for the round four students, we're currently in the process of making those matches. So stay tuned and we will get in touch and let you know who your buddy is. Um, I really encourage you to make the most of your buddy. So do reach out to them and do ask them about anything and everything under the sun. Um, they're there to kind of um, be, be a way that you can learn a little bit more about either where you're going to, the host institute or the country that you're going to without needing to email me because obviously I haven't had the experience. So they know more than I do. And yeah, communication, most of you are in the WhatsApp groups that we have set up. They are largely predominantly for sharing research opportunities, any relevant events or resources, any new publications that come up. And if you are not currently in one of those groups, please feel free to message me and I will add you to the group that's relevant to you. So many of you are also already following our Twitter account. Um, there's actually three Twitter accounts we have listed here. So there's the CGIAR climate one, which is the CCAF's Twitter account, and the GRA underscore GHD tw Twitter account, and also Hayden's Twitter account. And every, every one of those accounts is sharing, you know, the latest scientific publications and popular dialogues that are going on around those publications that are being made, et cetera. So please, if you post anything related to your CliffGrads experience, do use the hashtag CliffGrads um, Twitter hash. And yeah, I've just put in the email address again. You all probably already know that off by heart, but do feel free to reach out with any questions that you have on that email address also. So for some of the round four students, you haven't actually received uh, these two documents on um, the process around publication. So how to correctly acknowledge um, any publications related to your CliffGrades research and also the reporting requirements. But for everyone else, just a reminder that if you can please provide us the short summary report of your training and any kind of feedback that you have about the experience that you had so that we can continually improve the Cliff Grades program for you all. Um, and so that would be due four weeks after you complete your research visit, but feel free to email me if that's not possible for any reason. So for ongoing involvement in the Cliff Grades program, uh, Hayden mentioned it earlier in his presentation, but please do um, encourage your peers to apply for Cliff Grades and please also especially encourage women to apply for the Cliff Grades program. And yeah, feel free to reach out to us at any point in time. If you have any concerns, your feedback is really valuable to us. And we do just love to receive emails from you about what you're currently doing these days. Um, it's just really great to hear where you're at in your career. So yeah, thank you. I will hand over to Suniro to talk about 
some useful resources that may be relevant to probably all of you. Great, uh, thanks Hazel. Uh, and uh, as uh, we said at the beginning, so uh, uh, Hazel and I especially will be uh, assisting you throughout your journey uh, in this program from CCAFs and GRE uh, side. And, uh, and I would like to start uh, of our interaction uh, introducing you, introducing you to key uh, CCAFs and GRA resources that I'm pretty sure that will help you during your uh, research time and beyond, which are uh, the samples, uh, the MR, the egg MRV, the uh, ACGE calculator, the GRA uh, library, uh, and I, I'm gonna touch very briefly in the upcoming uh, CCAFs resource guide. Uh, so, uh, these are valuable resources to, to put something uh, up front, uh, providing you uh, supporting information from uh, basically A to Z in terms of low emissions development in the uh, agriculture sector. So, you can find resources spanning from uh, GAG emissions and mitigation options to uh, global climate negotiations, basically. Uh, so they are, that's why they are really, really helpful for uh, you through your uh, Cliff Grads uh, journey, as I said. So, okay, so we are in the next slide. So this is the samples. So samples uh, stands uh, for standard assessment of agriculture mitigation potential, potential and livelihoods. So through its uh, website, uh, samples uh, brings reliable information about uh, GAG emissions from agriculture in tropical countries, designed uh, to support developing countries uh, to improve data on agriculture emissions uh, and mitigation potentials. So samples, uh, in this sense, uh, provides a series of uh, reading materials and tools for estimating emissions uh, and accessing uh, mitigation options at many levels across the agriculture sector, such as for livestock cropping and agroforestry systems, right? So uh, samples uh, is coordinated by CCAPS uh, along a number of CGIR uh, centers and scientists, as well as global and regional partners. So next slide, please. So now we have the uh, MRV platform for agriculture. So MRV uh, stands for Monitoring, Reporting and Verification. And this platform specifically provides you resources and guidance for MRV of mitigation in agriculture. So the MRV platform provides tools, approaches and case studies for designing and implementing MRV uh, of uh, GAG emissions and mitigation actions in the agriculture sector. So it includes also, for example, uh, those aspects outlined in the, the Paris Agreement country pledges through their uh, country's nationally determined contribution or NDCs. So uh, next slide, please. So the third uh, resource is the uh, agro uh, chain greenhouse gas emission calculator. So this is a tool for estimating uh, GAG emissions associated with uh, food supply chain chains, including uh, food loss and waste. So it basically combines um, a calculation framework with data sets containing crops, GAG emission factors and food loss factors as well along several uh, egg value chains. And it can be used for identifying uh, hotspots and accessing net benefits, net benefits of interventions along the chain, right? So Cliff Grads has had um, uh, six students, if I'm not wrong, uh, especially working on food loss and waste. And uh, so far we have had uh, one scientific article uh, published in this field uh, using CCAPS resources and Cliff Grads uh, support. Uh, 
Uh, next slide, please. So the GRA uh, library, so this is a great uh, uh, library and, and repository with very rich material on greenhouse gas emissions, mitigation options and, to, and tools. So uh, it's also a great research to explore with lots of materials on this field. So uh, uh, next please, and uh, that's my last slide touching on the low emissions development resource guide that CKFC is, is developing. So uh, uh, this is the final resource I would like to, to present you today. Uh, this is uh, intended to be uh, launched in, uh, by October this year. Uh, and uh, it will be uh, a website intended to be a uh, resource on climate change mitigation and, uh, in agriculture and food systems, right? So it will uh, provide examples of emissions and mitigation options related to activities connected with agriculture, uh, land use chain, food supply chain, and food consumption, basically. So we are uh, designing it to be, um, to reach a large uh, range of users from those completely unfamiliar with mitigation to those seeking to expand their knowledge in the, a particular sector in these uh, egg uh, uh, emissions and mitigation uh, space. Right. So uh, uh, finally, it, as I said, there, there are lots of good and qualified information uh, in these resources. And uh, I really uh, encourage you to, to go there and get familiar with uh, these resources. And again, uh, I'm happy to, to assist you through your journey, journey and congratulations for, for, for being part of this Glyph Reds. I really hope you enjoy it and uh, I'm looking forward to, to, to working with you all. So now uh, back to you, Hazel, please. Thank you so very much, Sanero. Those were all really useful. It's really, really good to know about at the start of a CliffGrads research visit. So we do actually have one question here um, about, Sanero, perhaps you have any experience to share samples, um, to share about the samples resource, and if you've done any collection of data in the field, from yeah, so that's a question from uh, Adnan. Ad Adnan, okay, mm. Arshdan. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm understanding if I have a, a personal experience in sampling uh, greenhouse gas emissions, as I understand that, and uh, yes, I do, and. Uh, and well, and share my experience. Well, uh, I, I don't know if I, I got these uh, questions uh, right, but um, well, we we do have experience in in doing uh, these uh, sort of uh, uh, field campaigns and in and, and field uh, samples collection, etc. And uh, as we we said. We work in, in a sort of network among many uh, partners and in research institutions and organizations. So each of them uh, uh, have uh, experience in uh, agriculture field. And then our job is trying to understand what are the connections between these fields to drive uh, low emissions development uh, or design LED strategies and uh, implementation options, right? So we do have this experience and we do have a network with a large experience in this field that can be shared with you and put you in touch with. Thank you, Samira. Yeah, so I don't see any other questions coming through just at this stage, but of course you can email through or text me any questions at the end. Um, so just to start wrapping up, thanks to all of our presenters, to Hayden, to Titus, to Samuel, to Yuri, to Florencia, to Sanero as well. Really, really appreciate you all making the time to share your um, thoughts and experience with us.
And yeah, just to remind everyone to please register for the upcoming webinars. So the special sessions with our guest presenters and also the student thematic sessions. Um, open, of course, the special sessions to everyone, to the hosts and to the alumni and the thematic student sessions to all four rounds of the Profgrads program. And Yeah, we just have the final resources in there for you, but thank you all very much for making the time and joining us today. It's been really wonderful. So thank you. Thank you so much, Hazel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to share. I like it. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank Stay you. safe, everyone. Stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Hazel. Thanks, Mira.